how to be a critical thinker. Number one, probably the most important thing is to be a skeptic. And um, this just means to have a, a questioning attitude and don't necessarily believe everything that you read or hear. Okay, so before you decide to believe something, actually think about, does this make sense? Let's question it a little bit. Um, if you need some specifics, how to question information, let's just list out some things that you could ask, literally. Okay, so first off, who is it that's saying this information? Okay, who is it? That's gonna make a difference in terms of whether you think it's true or not. Okay, the person, the person's reputability um, is something that you might want to consider. You should also consider what evidence they present. So are they just saying something or are they saying something and giving some evidence to support? Okay, if there's evidence, that's going to, that's gonna help to back up what they're saying. Um, think about the person's qualifications. So um, there, are, there are some people who like to talk about things even if they don't necessarily have a education in that field. Um, they might not necessarily be qualified to be talking about it, but they still enjoy talking about it. So sometimes it's good to keep that in mind too. If a person has a lot of qualifications, like if they're trained in whatever field it is that we're dealing with, um, then maybe it's a little bit easier to believe what they're saying. Um, oh, next on the list, this is kind of a interesting one. Are they being paid to say this? So there are actors, right? Actors get paid to act. And sometimes this comes up in other contexts, not just in movies, but, um, but literally is someone being paid to present a particular perspective with some information. It's a good question to ask. Where's the evidence to back a claim? So that's kind of a repeat actually. Um, evidence shows up twice on this list. What's the evidence? That's the good, good thing to ask here. So all of these questions, these are things that you, obviously you don't necessarily need to say out loud all of the time, but they are things that you should mentally be considering when you are reading different sources of information. These all help you to be a skeptic when it comes to taking in, deciding what information is valid or perhaps not valid. Second on the list, how to be a critical thinker, is learn how to read graphs. This one might be a little bit of a surprise to have here, but graphs do a really great job of conveying data, conveying information very concisely and very effectively. If you can read graphs, you can learn a lot of information directly from the graph without having to have someone interpret it for you necessarily. Um, graphs, unfortunately, graphs can also be used to mislead. So if you don't know how to read a graph properly, then it's easier to be misled perhaps about what the data is actually saying. Let's take a look at a graph together here. Um, this is this is from our textbook. And on the left, what we're looking at is a graph. This is a histogram. And it's showing a graph that um, is representing some time. So on the, on the horizontal axis, we have time spanning from the year 1910 all the way up to the year 2000. And the data that's represented here, um, in this case, it's cases of a hypothetical disease. So number of disease cases. It looks like it drops off a little bit. It's pretty low, drops off, and then it really starts to increase as we get into the 1900s. Okay, so that's looking at the full set of data. Jump on over to this graph. This graph has what's called a split axis. It's representing the same information, but there have been some years cut out. And if you don't know how to read graphs, you might not notice that fact. So right here, there's a jump from 1910 to 1960. And by presenting the data this way, um, it looks like this disease has always been increasing in numbers. Okay, so there's a little bit of missing information now, and potentially that could mislead somebody. Kind of depends on the context and what the what the um, source of information is trying to say. But anyway, it's just good to to be able to read graphs for yourself, be able to interpret the information that's presented in a graph and notice those little sorts of details. So those are, that's one example anyway of being able to 
Frida Graf. Number three, appreciate the value of statistics. So statistics, this is kind of like an analysis of the numbers, an analysis of the data. And um, by having statistics, what does that do? That really helps us to figure out how confident can we be in some information? Okay, so for example, um, if you have, if you do a, a scientific study, and let's go back to the drug example. Let's say you compare one person who has high blood pressure and you give them the drug and you compare them to another person who got a placebo. So you compare two people, right? Um, that's not very much data. As far as statistics go, that's not really enough information to provide you with a lot of confidence in your final conclusion. Okay, it would be a lot better to have more people involved in both of those groups. And then the statistics would allow us to determine um, how confident can we be in the outcome. So statistics, it's all about helping us figure out um, how much confidence we can have in information. Generally in science, sort of the accepted standard is we can be really confident if we get the same result, same outcome 95% of the time. So in other words, if you, if you repeat an experiment 20 times and 19 of those times you get the same result, that means you can be pretty confident drug, that drug really did do an effective job at lowering blood pressure. Otherwise, um, if it was a lower percentage than 95, otherwise we would maybe not have that much confidence. We would say, mm, we're not quite 100%, well, we're not quite sure about this drug. We might need to do more investigations, figure out some other things that are coming into play. Okay, with regards to confidence, sometimes data can be presented with a plus or minus value after it. A good example of this is with polls. So a lot of times um, after a poll, when the results are presented, it'll say something like 52% of the respondents think this particular way. Um, and then it'll go on and say the poll has a margin of error plus or minus 3%. So what that's really saying is that um, we, since we weren't actually able to sample every single person, okay, not everybody responded to the poll, instead it was kind of a subset of people. So because of that, we have a little bit of uncertainty. And that plus or minus 3% is the uncertainty. It's like a margin of error. So it's telling us that the actual percentage actually falls within a range. It's 52%, um, give or take 3%. So in other words, somewhere in the range of 49 up to 55%. And we can't really know where in that range the actual um, the actual percentage would fall. So um, again, that's kind of helping you to figure out how confident are you in this precise number? How much wiggle room is there around that? Sometimes that changes your interpretation of what the data is saying. Number four of six, learning to be a critical thinker, is to distinguish anecdotes from scientific evidence. So, uh, here we go. Okay, what does this mean? What is an anecdote versus what is scientific evidence? Okay, an anecdote is something that is like a testimonial. It's a short report that's maybe not verified. Um, it might be true, it certainly could be true, but it's not backed with any sort of statistical certainty. It's not backed by scientific studies necessarily. Um, and so it's, it's different. It's different from having scientific evidence. A good example of an anecdote is something like, my grandmother says this is the best remedy for something. Okay, your grandmother says she probably does have a lot of a personal experience to back that claim up, but um, that's just coming from one person. It's not something where lots of people were involved in a study, um, so we don't have the same sort of statistical backing to support the claim. Another place that this comes up a lot is when famous people speak on, on different subjects. Um, people tend to believe when they hear someone familiar speaking about something. So if an actor, a famous actor, talks about something, if they say, this particular drug worked well for me, um, probably people are going to believe that, even though this is actually just anecdotal an anecdotal claim. This isn't something that means the drug will work for everybody. It doesn't even mean it will work for 10% of the population. Um, the fact that it worked for this actor 
this could just be because the actor's biology is a little bit different from most other people's. Um, we don't we don't know. We don't have that scientific evidence. So being able to sort these different sorts of claims out becomes important. Continuing on down the list here, being able to separate facts from conclusions. This gets kind of difficult. This is um, difficult but doable. Okay, being able to separate facts from conclusions. A fact is something that is a piece of information. It's something that's verifiable. Um, it's a piece of information. A conclusion is sort of like an interpretation based on that information. So it's a judgment. It's, um, it's based on facts, but it goes a little bit further. It's kind of like um, it's kind of like extrapolating a little bit further from just the raw information. A great example of this is as follows. Okay, consider this statement. The average global temperature went up 0 0.1 degrees Celsius last year. That's a fact, right? It's something that was measured. It's a piece of information. But then it goes on and it says, comma, proving that global warming is occurring. And this is a little bit tricky. Okay, global warming might be occurring, but that statement right there, that's a conclusion. That's a conclusion that somebody is drawing based on this piece of information. And if you go on and read what the slide says there, um, it's important to consider, well, are, what, what are the normal temperature fluctuations? Like, do, do the te does the temperature normally fluctuate up and down by 0.3 degrees? If so, then this is within that range, right? It's within the range of normal temperature fluctuations. So um, if that were the case, then this conclusion might not be warranted. And um, so this kind of ties back in with being a skeptic. Just learn to ask those those questions. Get additional information um, when you need to. Okay. I'm not trying to say that global warming is not happening. This is just an, an example um, to consider the difference between facts and conclusions. All right, finally, number six of six, learning to be a critical thinker. This is kind of a fun one. Understand the difference between correlation and causation. Okay, if two things are correlated, that means they have a close relationship. Maybe they tend to increase together or decrease together. That's a correlation. But that doesn't necessarily mean that one is causing the other. And the really classic example of this from statistics has to do with ice cream sales and drownings. Okay, so it turns out there is a high correlation between the number of ice cream sales and the number of drownings that occur. Unfortunately, those do correlate with each other. So, so then we can ask the question, does eating ice cream cause people to drown? Is ice cream causing people to drown? Is that causation link there? Um, and the, the answer to that is definitely no. Okay, it's kind of is an obvious answer. No, ice cream doesn't po cause people to drown. Um, rather, there's a third variable involved that hasn't been mentioned, and that's just the effect of um, in the summertime, people enjoy ice cream because it's hot outside, and people also enjoy swimming when it's hot outside. And so that temperature has not been mentioned, but that's kind of like a third lurking variable that's linking these two things together. Doesn't imply causation, um, although they are correlated with each other. Let's look at a little bit less obvious example. Example two here on the slide. Children who sleep with the light on are more likely to develop nearsightedness later in life. Okay, so that's a fact, that's something that can be observed. So let's ask the question, these two things, we know they're correlated, but does one cause the other? So we'll go on and ask the question, does sleeping with the light on cause nearsightedness? It's a fair question to ask. Um, okay, so there was a follow-up study that was done, and from that follow-up study, they found that children who develop nearsightedness are more likely to have parents who are nearsighted. Okay, so that's suggesting that there's a genetic predisposition to being nearsighted. And then here's the fun part, it goes on, and, and they also found that parents who are nearsighted are more likely to leave the light on at night. <laughs> okay, so it's not that the light is causing children to become nearsighted. There's not a proof of causation there. Um, it's just kind of an interesting 
an interesting correlation that happens to exist based on the behavior of the parents. So a couple of examples of that correlation does not necessarily imply causation. So you can keep that in mind.